Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Mario Livio, who uh, was formerly at the Space Telescope Science Institute, is now at uh, associated with UNLV and also the Weizmann Institute in Israel. He's also the author of uh, a number of books. Um, the most recent book is Galileo and the Science Deniers. Um, she also got a couple books that I have here. I have this one called Why, uh, What Makes Us Curious, which is, I guess, sort of the one that is most removed from your work in, in the natural sciences. It really explores other areas. Uh, but you've written uh, this book, Brilliant Blunders, from Darwin to Einstein. Um, this one, The Golden Ratio, uh, the story of phi, the world's most astonishing number, also is God a mathematician, the equation that couldn't be solved, and the accelerating universe. Welcome, Mario. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, you, you are an, an astrophysicist uh, by, by training, <laughs> and um, yes. so you've spent most of your, your life in the natural sciences. Um, but I first found out about you because of this book here, uh, Why, What Makes Us Curious. And, you know, I don't know, when you put a title of a book like this out, right, What Makes Us Curious, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't help myself. <laughs> I got to go and buy that book because curiosity is probably one of my favorite uh, topics. And, and I think for those people who would, would describe me, that would probably be the number one thing that would come to mind and, and so I, I guess one question I would have for you is, you know, what made you curious about curiosity? I mean, is, is it, right, do, do right, you feel like, well, right. you've been doing, you're a scientist, you do, this is who you are, this is what you do, right? That's exactly right. I mean, I, I've always been very, very curious myself. Uh, of course, curious as a scientist, but I've been curious otherwise as well. You know, I, uh, I always liked art, for example, very much. Uh, at home, I have many books on art and so on. Um, and it's, at some point, I became very curious about curiosity, really, as, as you have put it. Uh, you know, what is it that drives all that and so on? So I spent about five years, because this is not really my area of expertise. So I spent about five years re reading research about curiosity in psychology and in neuroscience, and I interviewed many people who work in those areas. I visited some labs and so on. And then, you know, after five years, I decided to write that book about curiosity. Well, of course, there's, it's not just one thing. And I think part of the book, you, you dig into all of these different kind of categories of, of, right. of curiosity, right? And um, in particular, right, you, you know, one of the dichotomies that you point to is this idea between kind of epistemic and perceptual curiosity. Another one is specific versus uh, uh, diversive curiosity. And, um, and you also mentioned that uh, curiosity, while we tend to think of it as a, an unalloyed good thing, it hasn't always been seen as, as a good thing, right? I mean, you could, you could maybe even have too much of it. Right. So, uh, indeed, uh, you've packed there many questions into one. Um, so, uh, first, yes, curiosity has not always been seen as a good thing. I mean, uh, you know, it, it is enough to start with the biblical story of Eve, right, and who was very curious about this particular, the fruits of this tree of knowledge. And then, you know, Adam and Eve get uh, punished very severely. Uh, well, you know, who was it that called her the first natural scientist? Yeah, right. The, 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 there was somebody who did that. But the thing is that uh, you, if, you, if you read the story more carefully, you actually, in that particular story, see that they were really more punished for their disobedience because they were told specifically not to eat from the, for the fruits from that tree. But, uh, you know, we have all kinds of things about, you know, Pandora's box, stories that are very similar to that, um, where um, curiosity is not always rewarded uh, and, in fact, often punished. So, so that's about that part. Uh, the part about 
categorizing different types of curiosity. So again, that's not me because, like I said, I'm not a curiosity researcher per se. Uh, there was a psychologist named Daniel Berlin, and he tried to map curiosity on two axes like this. One axis going from perceptual to epistemic curiosity, another one from diversive to to spe specific. Um, so maybe you want me to explain a little bit about what each one of those means. Um, well, yeah, and also, I mean, see, some, you know, curiosity, there's one approach to it, which is, sees it as akin to kind of hunger or, or thirst, right? Now, now, most of us would never say, oh, yeah, you know, being hungry is a great thing. Like, we need people to be more hungry, right? You know, we need people to be more thirsty we need people to be more more lustful like we, we normally don't say that but when we talk about curiosity we're like yeah you know we want people to be more more curious right so right. But, that analogy but, is, is similar but it kind of breaks down right but it is there exactly that this difference between perceptual and epistemic curiosity come into play because perceptual curiosity is the curiosity we feel when something surprises us or when something kind of doesn't agree with what we know or think we know. And it is that curiosity which, when studied on the neuroscience side, they find that the areas in the brain that are associated with conflict or sometimes with hunger or thirst, uh, they are the ones that activate are activated also when you have that type of curiosity. Epistemic curiosity, on the other hand, is when we really want to learn something new or we want to understand something we didn't understand before and there actually the area in the brain that's that's activated is the one that's activated for anticipation of a reward you, you know it's like when you i don't know sit in a theater for a play you wanted to see for a long time or when somebody offers you a piece of chocolate so that's the one that we want people to really have more of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to be more curious epistemically. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you make some references to literature and I think you started the book with Kate Chopin and you ended the book with uh, Mark Twain and, you know, really good literary authors will make the reader want to keep reading. Right. And, and so it's, it's like they'll, They'll, they'll create an itch and then, you know, you, you scratch it and then they create another itch. And, and you know, maybe the, the book was written, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So I think maybe it was written today. You'd probably use Netflix as the example, right? Because, you know, Netflix does that at the end of every episode. You're like, oh, I wonder right. what's going to happen next. And then they, they feed you the next episode. Right. But, you know, this is precisely why I mentioned Kate Chopin. Because, you see, Netflix... And, you know, in, in general, TV series, um, they do this somewhat artificially. I mean, they create an artificial cliffhanger at the end of every episode to make you, you know, want to watch it. Uh, really good authors like Kate Chopin do this effortlessly. I mean, you know, it's, uh, she creates this intellectual cliffhangers at the end of every sentence, uh, which makes you want to continue to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about like Wikipedia versus versus TikTok, right? So, you know, with Wikipedia, because somewhere in the book, you're, you're talking about whether the internet was going to kind of um, be good or bad for, for, for curiosity. And, and, you know, if curiosity is just sort of this pursuit of the novel, then, you know, TikTok do, does a pretty good job, right? I mean, it's just, you, you know, you get this little burst of, of you know, curiosity, satisfaction, and then another one, and then another one, another one. Whereas with Wikipedia, you, you know, you, you have a, a question and then you, you, you're seeking it out. I mean, are, are, are those examples of, of kind of the, 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 the dichotomy, one of the dichotomies within curiosity that you discuss? Yes, but it is it is more than that because indeed you touched upon the fact that people often you know when I gave talks about the book often ask me so isn't you know aren't people less curious today because there is Wikipedia and this and that and I said look Wikipedia is very good 
to satisfy your specific curiosity. This is when, you know, okay, you cannot remember the name of the actor who played in that particular film, or I don't know what, and that you can find on Wikipedia immediately, and it saves you a lot of time, you know. But that is not, you will not find the answers to uh, scientific questions that are in current research in Wikipedia because we don't know those answers yet. So they cannot appear in Wikipedia. So I don't think that Wikipedia can kill our curiosity. In fact, it saves us time on specific curiosity and allows us more time for epistemic curiosity. Now, the, the individuals that you point to as sort of paragons of curiosity, you know, one is an ancient Da Vinci. I mean, he's not at, not that ancient. I guess he, he's a modern, early modern. And uh, Richard Feynman, who is, uh, I guess, more of a contemporary. And, you know, a lot of people would say that they were, were, were polymaths, right? In other words, they pursued they no, knowledge in, in a wide range of, of disciplines. Um and they were also very, very creative. And, and so, you know, when I was reading the book, sometimes you would talk about curiosity and sometimes you talk about creativity and it, they seem to be highly correlated. And then the, these other folks are, are, you know, these are very broad in terms of their curiosity, but there are other folks that are, you know, very, very, very deep. Do, do does, does breadth of, uh, breadth, is that something that is sort of correlated with curiosity? I mean, or can, can you be someone who's, you know, deeply curious about one thing and you just want to keep going deep, 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 deep in that one area? Yeah, I think you can be d deeply curious about the one thing, yes. And, and you can also be curious about, I mean, the people who have more breadth, um, they also have more of this diversive curiosity. You know, I mean, Da Vinci was... A, a, a very good example that it appears that you, you know when he took on a project he only was interested in that project for as long as he didn't satisfy his basic curiosity but at that point he left it and turned to something else uh, which in his case you know turned out not to be that good because in spite of the fact that he did many things he also didn't finish many things he was famous for not finishing uh, you know many things. Um, so yeah, so there 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 is this interplay between the different types uh, of curiosity in different people. Now you mentioned something else that was interesting, which was this potential connection between curiosity and creativity. And there, I, I believe I mentioned it in the book. There was this uh, late uh, psychologist from University of Chicago. Uh, Mihai Csikszent Mihai, uh, who wrote a book about creativity, where he interviewed about a hundred people, creative in different disciplines, and uh, if there was one thing that he found that was common to all these hundred people was that they were deeply curious people. So curiosity seems to be uh, sort of a necessary condition for creativity even though not always a sufficient condition for creativity. So, I mean, when we look at people like Da Vinci and, and Feynman, I mean, some people might think that they have, I don't know, some kind of cognitive problem, right? I mean, you, you say in the book that if you were to d describe the, their, their work habits, um, you know, they might get diagnosed with, uh, with, with, with ADHD, Right. I mean, uh, da, da Vinci for sure. I, 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 I'm not sure about Feynman, but da, da Vinci for sure. I, I, I'm not even the only person to have said that about Da Vinci. Yeah, he probably would have been diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And and because he, he had trouble finishing things because he would always move from, you know, from project right. to, to project. Right. Yeah. So yeah, but that, that seems to be a feature, always, not a bug, right? That seemed to be a feature, not a bug. In his case, it certainly, yeah, in his case, it certainly was. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, some of the people who paid him did not think it was a feature because he wouldn't finish their projects. Um, so, yeah. Right. And, and so, I mean, 
this curiosity, this is something which I guess is valuable in certain environments and, and not in others. I mean, look, if you're, if you're working in a factory and your job is to just turn a crank every day and there, there really isn't much that you need to learn in order to succeed, then curiosity seems like a luxury, right? I mean, is, is curiosity a, a characteristic that is desirable kind of only in, in certain environments if we think about it from a, a fitness standpoint? Um, I don't think so necessarily. Clearly, there are, you know, areas, branches, like, you know, if you work in science, clearly you are curious about certain things. And like you say, if you work in a factory, uh, you know, maybe it gives you le less, fewer opportunities for that. But, uh, you know, even if you work in a factory, I mean, a person who works in a factory, if they are curious and, you know, as a result, creative, they could think maybe of ways of uh, making things more efficient or uh, making things go faster or, you know, other things and so on. And, and I'm sure that in every environment, there are such people who do that. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people, uh, you know, who maybe they're not curious about that particular thing. Maybe they are curious about sports. So they don't contribute in that work environment. They go home and be and are very curious about sports or something else or music or I don't know what. Um, people, there is nobody who isn't curious at all other than people who all have very, very serious mental problems. Uh, it's just that people are curious about different things. Uh, you know, somebody may be curious about the universe and somebody else may be uh, more curious about the love life of movie stars or something like that. But, you know, they still are both curious. Well, I mean, do we, do we have a way of, of, of measuring curiosity? I mean, it, it correlates to some extent with the openness variable in the big five, right? But, I mean, do we have right. a, a way of 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 measuring it over a, a lifetime or across individuals or even even across species i, I don't I, i'm not sure that uh, you know uh that there is something like a ranked order you know of things i mean of course people have a feeling about somebody being extremely curious or not and so on but uh, I don't think you would go into a psychology lab and they would give you, you they would say, oh, you are curious at the 43 level and somebody else at the 56 level. Uh, no, I don't think there is that type of thing. There is, of course, uh, you know, brain activity that can be measured, but that is never, you know, a direct measure of curiosity. Mm -hmm. well, well, some of the tests that you, you describe in the book, right, where you subject other primates to um, anomalies, right? And uh, they, they don't seem to be terribly curious about trying to figure out like what's what's going on, right? right. They're not interested in teasing out the causation, whereas whereas humans right. almost all are, right? When they see something weird, they, they kind of want to resolve you're it right. and figure out what's you're going right. on. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean... Primates, even, you know, even the most, the closest to us, you know, chimpanzees and so on, uh, they, they don't worry about why. I mean, they are curious, you know, they are curious where, where is the best food, perhaps, things like that and so on. But you, you cause and effect are not something they are really very curious about. And, and the, the why question and sometimes even how doesn't really cross their minds. Yeah, that, that's the main, maybe the main difference between human curiosity and curiosity of animals. Yeah, I've interviewed a lot of people uh, and about the topic of what makes humans different. And of course, you know, there's everything from opposable thumbs, right, to, 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 to language. But, but this curiosity thing, I mean, this, this seems to be our, our superpower, right? I mean, of course, it's hard to do without language, it's hard to run experiments without opposable thumbs, but it seems like the, the, this, this desire to understand the world, the desire to make sense of it, the desire to tease out cause and effect 
I mean, that's sort of what has created the the big gap between us and our near relatives. You, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, because humans have always been much, much more curious about about many things that on the face of it had nothing to do with everyday survival. Um, I, I mean, you know, animals, they are, you know, of course, worried about survival and so on and this. We humans, you, you know, I, I, I study astrophysics. Yes, I mean, astrophysics uh, one day perhaps will contribute, you know, to our everyday lives. But today certainly doesn't that much. Um, of course, every basic science, it's like that with it. I mean, you know, when it's basic science, it doesn't uh, yet apply to our everyday lives, and eventually it does. But we do it never still, you know, when it doesn't. Uh, you, you know, I like this phrase that, that there is uh, applied science and not yet applied science. Uh, because the basic science eventually gets applied. But when we do it, we do it for curiosity, not for the application. Well, I mean, what's the, what's the evol- evolutionary rationale for that? I mean, yeah, okay, if, if I can figure out a better way to hunt, that, that, that's going to give me an, an advantage. But, I mean, if I can figure out a you know, better way to count the moons of Saturn, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's hard to see how that really gives me a leg up against my, my colleagues. Well, obviously it did, right? Because this has led you to being able to develop the kind of technology that we are using right now to talk, which does give us a leg up on every other type of life on Earth, right? Other than humans. So, well, I like also even even. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was just saying, even though the results were not immediate, I mean, clearly, you know, they came eventually. Well, you also discuss the the ways that children appear to be um, a lot more curious than young members of other species, but also in, in some ways maybe, right, more curious than, than adults. And, and I think there's this narrative that, um, curiosity is something we're all born with, and then it kind of gets stomped out of us, right? Um, but, but in a sense, it kind of kind of makes sense, right? To, because the the marginal benefit to curiosity is clearly going to be a lot higher when you you don't you start off knowing nothing than it is after you have accumulated some critical mass of knowledge. Of course, and and it is the perceptual curiosity that really declines because you know you. You are less surprised by things and so on and this and that. But it turns out that epistemic curiosity was found, you know, not to to decline much with age. I mean, people, you know, are always still interested in, you know, learning new things and so on. I mean, even though they are less surprised by many, many things. What I found interesting about the work on children is that children seem to have a way of exploring that kind of maximizes information gain, right? So they, they're they doing entropy reduction in the ways that we teach people to do it, say, in a data science class. You know, they're, 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 they're looking at the things that seem to be the, the biggest anomalies and then, you know, working their way down to the, the, the less important ones. Right. And they're extremely curious about cause and effect from very early on very interested in cause and effect and and realize that there is a cause and effect that, you know, that effects have causes. I think it was John von Neumann. He he, he had this quote, right? When will we know that, you know, artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, really uh, for real. And he said, when it starts to play like, like children, I don't think we're there yet. I don't know whether, you know, generative AI is out there, you know, playing like children, but I think that's, that's what he meant. He meant that, you know, they were exploring in a playful way, right? Trying to, um, you know, get the maximum information gain through through curiosity. Right. And, you know, m- machine learning is sort of going into that direction, right? I mean, you know, the, uh, you know if you, uh, the, the first 
machines that played chess, you just fed them with, with a million games, uh, you know, and they, they, from that they played. But, uh, you know, today's chess playing programs, they teach themselves. They start from zero, essentially, and they just play against themselves again and again, and, and, and they teach themselves. Yeah. Now, look, if, if we took this economics approach to curiosity, then, right, there would be diminishing returns to knowledge. So you would, you know, be very hungry and then you would start learning some stuff and then you'd become less hungry and then you'd learn a little less and then you'd become less hungry. But it seems like curiosity doesn't go down with more knowledge. Oftentimes it actually goes up with, with more knowledge, right? I mean, you, you need to have a certain minimum amount of knowledge in a domain to stimulate to jumpstart that curiosity in, in that domain. I mean, if you came to me and started talking to me about quantum physics, I, I would just be like, yeah, I'm not, you know, you've lost me. I, I'm going to go somewhere else where I can, I can make more progress. Right. Right. But you know, it is there where, uh, you know, this uh, psychologist and economist Lowenstein who came up with this uh, inverted U shape, you know, uh, parabola uh, thing where, where you look at, uh, curiosity versus knowledge. So basically, uh, when you know very little about something, you're not really very curious about it because you, you don't even know what to be curious about. And when you know a lot, re you know, when you feel that you know almost everything, you're again not that curious because you feel that the rest is details. But when you are kind of in the middle of this parabola, you know, where you know already quite a bit, but you still feel that there is a lot more to be known, that's when you are most curious. Mm -hmm. and, and you also talk about how, you know, the most curious people are, are people who are comfortable not knowing. I mean, they, they want to know, but they're, they're not intimidated by their, their, their ignorance, right? They, they, are, they can live with this negative capability. Right. right, Feynman um, was like that. Yeah, yeah. Feynman w definitely said it even in, in those words, that he's not intimidated by not knowing something, you know. So they don't need closure. Right. They don't need to say, okay, I've figured it all out, you know, let's put a ribbon and a bow on it and, and, and move on, right? They, they know that there's always more juice in the lemon and it doesn't bother them. Right, because, you know, the history of science has taught us that um, you, you never reach a point where you say, okay, there is nothing more to be known. In fact, with every advance you make, uh, you discover new questions. And sometimes the new questions are even deeper than the questions that you had before. And, and so, you know, you're never worried that, okay, there is the end of science and, you know, there is nothing more for us to, to study. So I think at one point you quoted someone who said that curiosity is the antidote to anxiety, right? But, but it, it seems yeah. like, you know, fear, and, fear and anxiety. Myself. Ah, I, okay. quoted myself. I coined that phrase, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. <laughs> well, I was wondering if you could dig into that because it, it seems like fear and anxiety are obstacles to curiosity, right? Yeah. And yeah, that's so, right. So do you, so, do, you, do, you con do you have to conquer the fear and anxiety first in order to you know open up the door to curiosity? Uh, no, no. Uh, what I meant by that, and by the way, I, I I did coin that phrase, but I discovered that later that I wasn't the first who thought along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which was in a way nice. Uh, you know, to discover that I. I, I saw this uh, big board at the, an art actually exhibit, which had a very similar type of phrase. Uh, what I meant by that is the following, that very often um, things we are afraid of are things that we know too little about. Um, you, you know, and uh, you, you know, if somebody uh, told you that, uh, I don't know that all immigrants to the U.S., they are all terrorists, uh, you know, then you would be very afraid of this, you know, and so on. Now, if you started to study a little bit more the immigration problem and you discovered that, 
you know, among these immigrants, there is this 77-old woman who came with her three-year-old uh, daughter, you know, who clearly are, have no interest in terrorism whatsoever, uh, then you are less afraid of this phenomenon, you know, and so on. And not only that, uh, very often uh, dictatorial regimes, uh, they uh, suppress curiosity by, by fear, by using fear. Um, so uh, that's why I said, you know, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. Once you learn more about the subject, you, you are less, less fearful from that. Well, well, not just societies, but also kind of corporations, uh, families, right? Other entities, um, they can either suppress or, or stimulate um, curiosity. And, you know, I'm, I'm in the world of, of management right at the moment. And, you know, managing a group of curious people can be, can be a handful, right? I mean, you know, a lot of managers, they want their employees just to kind of, you know, do their jobs and, and not be constantly on the, the lookout for uh, new ways of, of, of doing things. Now, I think over, over time, we've, we've seen most organizations move in the other direction where they, they want their employees to, to be uh, more curious, and they've run into difficulties kind of uh, stimulating it. So you, you talk a bit about how you can kind of stimulate curiosity, right? Starting as, as uh, in, 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 the, in the family, you, you, you quote Feynman and how he became very curious as, as a kid and his parental approach. I, I remember as a kid, you know, my parents would do the same thing, right? I would ask them a question and they, they would never answer for me. They would just sort of either give me a teaser or they would make something up, which was obviously wrong, you know, which, which forced me to, uh, to challenge them. Right. I mean, is, is, are there techniques that are well established for kind of stimulating curiosity? And is it important that you do this relatively early in life? The answer is, uh, I don't know if it is called, uh, uh, you know, you, you said if, if there is some sort of a universal approach. I, I'm not sure if there is a universal approach, but uh, when I wrote the book, I certainly thought about this. And, and, and judging a little bit from Feynman's uh, experience with his father and so on, um, I came up with this method, I thought, that one of the important things, let's suppose you want to make a certain person uh, more curious in something that you think is important. Uh, if you start with trying to talk about something that you think is important, it's not obvious that this person will get more curious about this. So the idea, uh, the best idea that I can think of is that you start with something that you know for a fact that this person is already curious about, but you find an ingenious way to move from that to the topic that you are interested in to begin with. And uh, I, I don't actually, you know, because I wrote the book a few years ago, I don't remember if I give this example or not, but th this is the way I think about this, that if you, let's suppose you want to explain to your six-year-old daughter uh, that, you know, free fall acceleration onto earth, is, is important, you know, it's an important phenomenon and so on. Uh, most six-year-old girls, if you will start by telling them, oh, there is a free fall acceleration and so on, I don't think they would be that curious about. But children, for example, in the US are very, very curious, tend to be, most of them, curious about dinosaurs. So you start with dinosaurs and you say all kinds of things about dinosaurs. And then you come to this story that 66 million years ago, uh, dinosaurs all got extinct by some asteroid that fell on Earth and hit the Earth near the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and, you know, and so on. And why did this asteroid fall on Earth? Because there is this gravitational force of the Earth which attracted this asteroid and accelerated through the thing. So you started with dinosaurs and got to this acceleration because of gravity. So the idea is to 
start with something the person is already curious about and get to um, you know the thing mm -hmm. that you were interested in making him curious or her curious about well i think the other point you made is that that the student has to expend some effort right to acquire the knowledge um if they you know otherwise the, the, the won't, they won't be as interested i mean i i i my consider my role as a teacher not primarily about a transmitter of knowledge but as a transmitter of, of, of curiosity and so I, I will strategically withhold things when i teach and this drives my students absolutely nuts right at the end of I, in my all my feedback they say look all we want are the takeaways right just give us the takeaways at the end of class and i'm like no i'm not going to give you the takeaways you got to figure the takeaways out on your own but but there seems to be i think a lot of people who feel like they're under time pressure they seem to think that they just they just want to get fed spoon fed knowledge but that's ultimately in the long run not not the best way for them to learn that stuff i i i agree with you unfortunately it is true you know that there are these classes that would tell you is this going to be in the test you know right <laughs> and that's all they are interested about <laughs> if it's going to be and if it's not in the test then it's not interesting right uh but uh, yeah that's partly because of the way uh, you know some of our core structures are are arranged and our uh, test structures are being made and so on um this is where you know more free floating seminars and things like that are uh, you know make a better job of of uh, stimulating curiosity yeah now i was wondering if you could talk about galileo for a bit you know one of the things that i found interesting in the curiosity book is that someone like da vinci when they were curious about something they, they would just go and try to figure it out on their own right they they would not go and i mean he perhaps because he was not as as literate as some other folks you know he he would not seek out the answers in some text he would you know try to figure it out on his own and and that seems to be um, a, a kind of a version of, of curiosity that, that, that's different from the one that's all about seeking out references. And, and it seems, you know, Galileo had a, a similar approach, which was, you know, he, he wasn't, he didn't trust necessarily the, the wisdom from, from on high. Um, you know, what is it exactly. about, about Galileo that, that makes him such a seminal figure in the history of science? Yeah, so... Uh, you know, he was uh, one of those who formulated what we call today the scientific method. Namely, that there is only one way of finding truths about nature. And that way is you start with observations and experiments. And from those, you eventually theorize something. And then you do new observations ex and experiments to test your, the theories that you formulated. So he was one of the first to put this into a sort of a methodical way of acquiring knowledge. Even though, you know, we don't quite follow that to the letter, but the idea is there. And so th that's what he did. He did experiments in mechanics, you know, he did many many experiments rolling balls down inclined planes and things and all these things eventually of course with a telescope observing all these things and working out the orbits of of everything and so on um so this this was really his tr main strength well the, the the book is called galileo and the science deniers i mean that's a bit of it i guess it's it's somewhat of a, an anachronistic uh uh, term um, when when you wrote the book, I mean, were you were you thinking uh, in part about the concern around science denial in, in in our world? Very, very much so. Yes, in fact, uh, I, I've always been a great admirer of Galileo, but uh, I, I all the time had an eye of science denial today, uh, which we unfortunately continue to see. It it, it is amazing to me that we still continue, you know, we've seen this, of course, continue to see this to some extent about climate change. We have seen this happening with the pandemic, uh, you know, so there are so many places where we are encountering science denial. 
and uh, and that's a very very dangerous trend, I think. Uh, so, yeah, one of the main reasons that I wrote the book was uh, to to you know to touch upon science denial that's happening today. Well, I mean, is is science denial really a, a denial of the, the the scientific method, or is it a um, selective? kind of use of science, right? In other words, start with the conclusion and then if, oh, wow, there's some great science that supports my conclusion, I'm going to, you know, I'll be happy to uh, reference it and, and quote it. No, no, it, it, no, it also, it also is denial of the scientific method to a large extent. Um, um, you know, especially, you know, when it ca- came to, uh, you know, when things su- suddenly become political rather than scientific, yeah. then, you know, this means that you uh, deny the science. I, there, are, there are things that are so simple and so obvious. I mean, you know, people have always seen, forget about the pandemic, people have always seen how doctors wear masks, right? Now, why they were wearing masks? They were wearing masks, you know, not to infect the patient, you know, and so on and this. Now, th- they were doing this un- even under normal times, right? And then there is this pandemic going on. So why wouldn't you want to wear a mask to both protect yourself and others, you know, and, and so on. This is so simple. This is not, uh, there is nothing here, you, you know, that requires a, a change in the way you think about the world or anything. But once this becomes a political issue, then suddenly you have a political reason why not to wear the mask. And that has nothing to do with the science. So uh, I find this very, very bothersome. Um, and, and similarly, you know, uh, c- climate change, uh, they just announced today that uh, 2023 has been the warmest year on record, the warm, absolutely hottest year on record. OK, and, um, you know, the consensus of about 97 percent of the scientific world is that this is largely human-made. But, you know, even if you think that the evidence for it being human-made is not 100% solid, but certainly human activity did not help this issue, there is no denial of that. So, you know, why wouldn't you try to think of how to, you know, make some changes at least to mitigate that? I'm not saying even dramatic changes, but, you know, some, some things to mitigate. So, so, so these things are worrisome. In addition, you know, you talked about denying the scientific method and so on. Um, when people, I have great respect for religious people, you know, and their faith and so on. Uh, but, and this is where we go back to Galileo. Galileo was a religious person. Almost everybody at his time was religious, yes? So he says, when there is an apparent conflict between a literal interpretation of scripture and what science shows us, scripture cannot be wrong, he says. So it means that simply our interpretation of the text is wrong. So he was not, you know, people tried to present him as if it was a clash between science and religion. It wasn't, and he never saw it as such. It was a clash between science and literal interpretation of the scriptures. That's what he was worried about. He was, in some sense, trying to save the church from making the mistake that, you know, later on it would be shown that, you know, it was wrong. So uh, he, was, he was saying, you, you must have misinterpreted that text mm-hmm. and so on. Uh, and yet there are still people today, believe it or not, who would like to teach science side by side with scripture as if these are equivalent theorizing, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, creation versus Darwinian evolution, let's say, or, or something like this. I have nothing about against people 
studying the Bible, but not in science classes. Uh, Galileo was saying, I don't believe that the same God who has given us our senses and reason wanted us to abandon their use. You, you know, so that was part of the reason why I wrote the Galileo book. Well, look, back then, I mean, these were people who had institutional power. Um, if right. the kind of science deniers are sort of maybe uneducated people that, that aren't sitting in positions of power, it's it's less it's less concerning, right? Um, and so, you know, if we look at the last couple hundred years, I mean, the science deniers, they've been marginalized increasingly um but but a lot of people think that that the that, that that's that trend has kind of reversed somewhat in in recent years i mean is there any is there any evidence of, of that i mean do, do 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 scientists feel more constrained in 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 say universities or in research labs uh or um than maybe they have been in the past well you know for example specifically concerning uh uh, climate change, I mean, there have been some attempts to censor, you know, statements made by scientists concerning uh, uh, climate change. So, you, you know, so yes, so there are phenomena. I agree with you that on the whole, I mean, of course, you know, our societies today, you know, more accept more accepting of science than it was maybe at, at other times. But um, but the fact that in the 21st century we still have some of that science denial is in itself somewhat shocking to me. And you also are someone who's deeply interested in, in arts, right? And, I, you know, we tend to think of science and, and art as very different domains, um, but all the folks that you point to as good examples of, of scientists, they've also had a, a deep interest in, in the arts. Um, and so is, is there a difference between the curiosity about the world and, and the curiosity about, you know, what it means to be human? Uh, yeah, I, I once tried to formulate this in my head in a certain way. And the best way I found to express this was that um, scientists try to understand the universe in some sense and make predictions about it, while artists give the human response, emotional response to the universe. So in some sense, these two things are complementary to each other. Um, that's the way I see this. But I, I, I would be very sad if we had one and not the other. So uh, I, I, I really like this uh, complementarity. Well, because some people, I guess William Blake most famously said, you know, but you take all the mystery out of the world when you, um, when you, when you um, gain a deeper science scientific understanding yeah. of it. I mean, yeah, that, that was, uh, is that, is, is, is he just uh, no, completely mis, mis, misguided there? Yes, I think so. And Keats too, the poet Keats, uh, completely misunderstood Newton's work. I mean, you know, you, you don't, you don't see less of the beauty of the rainbow because you understand how light reflects, you know, through, <laughs> through water and uh, and does the rainbow i i i don't think that uh, that is the case so so to to say that you know newton unweaved the rainbow uh is is i think a misguided thing and kids was very young so i i i pardon him for his being misguided well, I think you're someone who uh, manifests this sense of wonder, right? And, and uh, also not just shares your knowledge, but shares your um, love of uh, curiosity and wonder. Uh, and so let's check out this book. Uh, everyone check out this book called Why? Uh, what Makes Us Curious? And also all these other wonderful books about Galileo, Golden Ratio, and Brilliant Blunders. Thanks so much for joining me, Mario. Thank you very much for having me. 
Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.